of the great religious complex they built here. Most of what we actually see on the site at uh, the foot of Jebel Barkal today dates from a later period. But beneath these later temples, there were earlier Egyptian temples. The fact that there was a large fortress here, I mean, one would expect to be able to find these. Egyptian fortresses are absolutely massive structures, but we've neither found remains of the town, of the fortress, or of the associated cemeteries. But one thing is clear. Jebel Barkal was now the southern home of the supreme god Amun, and whoever ruled here had a divine right to rule both Kush and Egypt. Egypt's pharaohs had unwittingly set up their own downfall and the rise of the black pharaohs. Egypt's control of Kush ended around 1100 BC when troubles at home made a retreat inevitable. Around 900 BC, a new Kushite dynasty emerged from the shadows. Kings who were to mastermind the second coming of Kush. Their story begins at El Kuru, a few miles downstream from Jebel Barkal. The important thing about El Kuru is that it's really our major evidence indicating the origins of the second kingdom of Kush. Tim Kendall has extensively researched the cemetery at El Kuru. There evidently was a, a, an important dynasty here. I think the modest size of the tombs probably don't indicate their power and wealth. What we see here is a tomb sequence that begins with a very Kushite tomb. It's round, just like at Kerma. And then with each successive royal pair, we see the very rapid evolution to Egyptian burial customs. These people who are not ethnically Egyptian, suddenly they're adopting Egyptian practices. What's going on here? Kush's new rulers had designs on Egypt's wealth and a brilliant plan. At Jebel Barkal, they revived the Egyptian cult of Amun and restored the temple complex. Here we see exactly how the Kushites imagined Jebel Barkal. This is a temple built to the goddess Mut. Mut was the wife of Amun, who dwelled in the, in the mountain with her husband. The texts tell us that they're inside Jebel Barkal, and here is the cliff and the pinnacle is represented as a giant uraeus, the symbol of kingship. And it was Egypt's crown that the new kings of Kush now claimed. The pharaoh's declaration that Amun of Jebel Barkal had given them the right to rule both Kush and Egypt had exploded in their faces. In 750 BC, Egypt was in chaos, the remnants of power held by its priesthood. The priests welcomed a return to order through the kings of Kush, who could rule Egypt with the authority of Amun of Jebel Barkal. And so Pianki, king of Kush, swept into Egypt. The time of the black pharaohs had come. The vanquished were now the victors, and Pianki and his successors would rule over the riches of Egypt for the next century. But military campaigns and ceremonial occasions aside, Kushite pharaohs left the daily running of Egypt to their womenfolk, as Betsy Bryan explains. These are the uh, funerary chapels of the gods' wives of Amun, and in fact, Amunirdis and Shepin Wepet, who are represented here, are members of the royal family of the Kushites. These women, in fact, were left very much to their own devices because their brothers are busy doing other things. So these women represented the Kushite family at the head of Egypt itself. This is a representation of Shep and Wepet, and she is shown in the way that the ancient Egyptians showed Kushites uh, as a separate ethnic group from them. Uh, she has a very broad face, but also around the outside of her nose there is a slight fold, uh, almost a wrinkle of flesh, which we call the Kushite fold. And uh, here Shep and Wepet was perfectly happy to be shown as an ethnic Kushite in her own monument because she was very proud of the fact that that's, she was a royal family member. The Kushite rulers of Egypt never tried to present themselves as Egyptians. 
they had very distinctive royal regalia. They used their Sudanese names, and not one of them was buried in Egypt. They all came back to this place. Four Kushite black pharaohs were buried at El Kuru, their tombs meticulously excavated by Reisner. But once again, his interpretations buried the real story. Reiser excavated Kuru and did a very good job of it. However, his uh, conclusions are a bit bizarre. He believed that there was a branch of the Libyan royal family that came down here and ruled it over the local people. Libyan is a kind of watchword for light-skinned. So it was kind of a racist interpretation of history based on his own biases. The greatest of all the forgotten black pharaohs was Taharqa. In 690 BC, he ascended to the thrones of Kush and Egypt in a reign that was to last 26 years. In time-honored fashion, Taharqa made the great Egyptian monuments his own. Taharqa really built an enormous entranceway here in Karnak to essentially take over this, the largest temple complex in the world. And uh, it was already a completed temple, and all he had to do was to put this huge monumental colonnade up. That transformed the whole temple into a Kushite monument. Essentially, Karnak became his. At home, Taharqa adorned monuments, claiming, never before had the like been seen since the time of the gods. And he showed himself doing what pharaohs must do holding up the heavens and maintaining order in the cosmos. At Kawa, Taharqa's temple sits within a whole city still buried in the sand, which Derek Wellsby will excavate over the next 10 years. You can't come and see this temple without seeing this, because this is the man himself, the man who created the thing. This is Taharqa here, processing towards a series of gods on the wall of his own temple which he built between 684 and 680 BC. The sand still holds many of Taharqa's and Kush's secrets, as Tim Kendall discovered. Well, we were driving from Khartoum to Jebel Barkal, and it's about a whole day's drive, endless miles of sand, and we're kind of lost. And I looked out the window and thought I saw a column drum, thought I was dreaming, and then another one went by another one. Suddenly we found this incredible sight, just like in the movies. I mean, the implications of this place are enormous. I mean, he here it is, a prominent Kushite town, and it's 60 kilometers from the Nile. So there must be a whole string of settlements between here and there. One of the wonderful things about this site is that it opens up an entire new area of the Sudan that has never really been explored archaeologically, and it makes us realize how much there is here that ha hasn't been found or recognized yet. I mean, we're rewriting the history of, the ancient history of this country on a yearly basis. During his long reign, Taharqa became known far and wide. He is even mentioned in the Bible, aiding the king of Judea in his war with Assyria. And Assyria would test Taharqa's strength soon enough. How Taharqa organized his army remains a mystery, but some evidence for it remains way out in the desert which Derek Wellsby wants to see for himself. We're going right up uh, into the lower Wadi Hawar to see a massive uh, Kushite fortress at Galu Abu Ahmed. It's only discovered in the 1980s. It's a really special place. Apparently there's a very big dune field between us and this fortress. So you've got to go really fast so you don't get stuck in the sand. But if they're barking dunes, they have an almost vertical face on the south side. And you go over those at speed and that's the end of it. It's hopeless. Stuck again. They're very soft, these dunes on top. Let's go straight down to the axles. There it is, right across the wadi there. Guys, that's a massive, much bigger than I thought it was going to be.